Hello friends, today I will discuss about adrenal insufficiency. Adrenal insufficiency is characterized by decreased glucocorticoids or mineralocorticoids or sex corticoid secretion by the adrenal glands. It is seen in about 5 individuals in 10,000 general population among which uh, 3 in 10,000 people have a defect in hypothalamus or in the pituitary gland causing the decreased production of uh, ACTH which in turn leads to decreased production of cortisol or steroids by the adrenal gland okay whereas 2 in 10,000 population uh, have defect primarily in the adrenal gland and uh, among this primary adrenal insufficiency patients 50 percent are acquired and the most common is autoimmune etiology like autoimmune adrenalitis etc autoimmune destruction of gland is the most common acquired cause okay uh, uh, rest 50 percent is because of genetic causes and the most common genetic causes is uh, involvement of enzymes uh, in the steroidogenesis and some genetic defects which can lead to congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Invariably all types of congenital adrenal hyperplasia patients will have deficiency of glucocorticoids uh, with or without mineralocorticoids. Okay? But note the adrenal insufficiency due to hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis suppression secondary to exogenous steroid therapy is by far the most common uh, reason for adrenal insufficiency according to 0.5 to 2% of population especially in developed world. Okay. Coming to the primary adrenal insufficiency causes, the most common cause is autoimmune adrenalitis. This autoimmune adrenalitis can be isolated or occur in association with autoimmune polyglandular syndrome. So in isolated it occurs in about 30 to 40 percent of patient, patients and in the form of autoimmune polyglandular syndrome it accounts for 60 to 70 percent of cases of autoimmune adrenalitis. Okay. So autoimmune polyglandular syndrome. What is autoimmune polyglandular syndrome? It is of two types, type 1 and type 2. And uh, autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type 1 accounts for 10% of uh, autoimmune polyglandular syndrome, whereas uh, type 2 accounts for rest 90% of APS cases. And uh, APS1 type 1 is autosomal recessive in inheritance, whereas it is Type 2 is polygenic inheritance. That means uh, many genes are involved in the causation of this disease. Uh, it is a uh, APS type 1 is due to mutation in autoimmune regulator gene, AR gene, AIRE, autoimmune regulator gene. The mutation in AIRE gene causes type 1 autoimmune polyglandular syndrome whereas type 2 is associated with uh, HLA-DR HLA-DR3 and also associated with uh, defects in CTLA-4 and PTPN22 genes okay uh, APS type 1 is associated with chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, hypoparathyroidism 
and other autoimmune disorders and it uh, it can rarely cause lymphomas whereas type 2 is associated with thyroid autoimmune disease whether hypo or hyper uh, hyperthyroidism vitiligo and premature ovarian failure these are the common association the less common association are type 1 diabetes mellitus and pernicious anemia so coming to the other causes of primary adrenal insufficiency that is genetic causes uh, one of the important one is X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy. Adreno it is an X-linked disorder. So, hence it is common in or mostly seen in males only. Okay. It is due to mutation in XALD gene leading to defect in peroxisomal membrane transporter ABCD1. Okay. Because of this mutation, very long chain fatty acids get accumulated in the cells and uh, this uh, disorder can manifest uh, in three forms. In most, of, most common form, in 50% of individuals, it usually begins at, at childhood uh, in the form of cerebral adrenoleukodystrophy and in 35% of cases, it involves the myelons and uh, it causes uh, adrenomyeloneuropathy and in 15 percent of cases there is only isolated adrenal insufficiency the other common genetic uh, reason for adrenal insufficiency is congenital adrenal hyperplasia which is uh, by far the most common in case of genetic causes and other inborn causes like uh, kian sayan syndrome Kinsair syndrome is a mitochondrial disorder and also image syndrome mirage syndrome triple A syndrome So these are all very rare syndrome that can cause adrenal insufficiency and these uh, constitute uh, nearly less than 1%. Okay? So coming to the next very important cause, though rare cause, it is important cause is uh, adrenal infections like tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a very important cause for adrenal insufficiency especially in developing world we need to rule out tuberculosis and HIV, cytomegalovirus, cryptococcosis, histoplasmosis, fungal infections like histoplasmosis, cryptococcosis and coccidiomycosis. Okay? Uh, the common point among all these infections is uh, most of these infections occur in immunocompromised patients and transplant patients, right? Okay, coming to the other important uh, causes, adrenal hemorrhage. Uh, as uh, primary adrenal efficiency is because of destruction in the adrenal gland, so adrenal hemorrhage is also an important uh, reason for uh, adrenal insufficiency. It is usually seen in meningococcal septicemia. What is the syndrome that is uh, seen in this uh, sepsis patient? Is Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. Okay. Leading to adrenal hemorrhage and sepsis, and the patient will also have high mortality rate if not treated appropriately. And uh, Primary APLA syndromes, primary antiphospholipid syndrome, patients are also at increased risk of clot in the uh, circulation of uh, adrenal glands, leading to infarction and hemorrhage into the gland. 
leading to acute adrenal insufficiency so what are the drugs that can uh, leads to adrenal insufficiency obviously they are anti adrenergic drugs which are mitotain etomidate ketoconazole rilostain and more importantly amino glutathione if you remember this mitotain etomidate and the ketoconazole are also used in the treatment of cushing syndrome especially in severe cases before the surgery to stabilize the patient okay and coming to the adrenal infiltration so what are the infiltrative disorders you know infiltrative disorders or metastasis but remember a small metastasis could not cause adrenal insufficiency for uh, to cause adrenal insufficiency the metastasis should be bilateral and bulky otherwise adrenal insufficiency is less common and the lymphomas are also infiltrate to other disorders or sarcoidosis amyloidosis and hemochromatosis so these are all the in various infiltrative disorders that that can affect the adrenal gland and leads to adrenal insufficiency so and uh, what is the final cause bilateral adrenal ectomy usually it is uh, see uh, it is the treatment of cushing syndrome when there is no localization the ultimate treatment is in the cushing syndrome is bilateral adrenal ectomy or after bilateral nephrectomy also sometimes we need to remove the adrenal glands these patients will develop uh, adrenal insufficiency obviously because without adrenaline there will be no steroids right so coming to the secondary adrenal insufficiency the secondary adrenal insufficiency is because of uh, decreased acth level uh, secretion from the pituitary or decreased crh uh, secretion from the uh, hypothalamus so it is basically because of dysfunction of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis okay after excluding the iatrogenic suppression the majority of cases are caused by pituitary or hypothalamic tumors Uh, like a large pituitary adenoma or other tumors like craniopharyngioma meningioma ependymoma all these tumors can also cause pressure on the pituitary and hypothalamus leading to uh, decreased secretion of uh, uh, acth or crh from these uh, structures okay and in addition Uh, during the treatment we do the surgery right so pituitary surgery or hypothalamic surgery or radiotherapy to pituitary or hypothalamus can also produce secondary adrenal insufficiency so other rare causes like pituitary apoplexy what is pituitary apoplexy it is a consequence of infected sorry infected pituitary adenoma if a large adenoma the patient's uh, vasculature is not enough to uh, supply blood to entire pituitary and the center part of the pituitary can be avascular can become avascular and they can become infected and which can leads to bleed and uh, and also transient decrease in blood supply during the uh, prolonged surgery with large volume blood loss 
can also decrease the blood supply to the pituitary and also um, during parturition Uh, if the patient is having PPH, postpartum hemorrhage, which is massive, there is decreased blood supply to the pituitary and leading to adrenal insufficiency, which is called Sheehan syndrome. Right? So these three things can also cause a pituitary, a pituitary apoplexy, which in turn leads to secondary adrenal insufficiency. The other rare causes are isolated ACTH deficiency, which is because of autoimmune disease like the autoimmune hypophysitis, hypophysitis commonly seen in pregnant, postpartum pregnant pe people, and also uh, because of pituitary infiltration. Uh, uh, secondary to various disorders like uh, histiocytosis, sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, metastasis, and granulomatosis with polyangiitis, which is also called vaginus. Okay, these are the things which can cause uh, secondary adrenal insufficiency by affecting the pituitary gland. And the genetic causes are very rare, and usually they involve the mutations in the ACTH precursor, which is called pro opio melanocortin and the deficiency of this uh, pro opio melanocortin can also lead to decrease ACTH which in turn leads to decreased steroidogenesis from the adrenal glands. Uh, before going to the clinical features in detail, let us uh, see the main differences between primary adrenal insufficiency and secondary adrenal insufficiency. In primary adrenal insufficiency, uh, both glucocorticoid and mandylocorticoid uh, are affected, secretion is affected. And in secondary adrenal insufficiency, what happens? In secondary, the pituitary and hypothalamic are damaged, but the adrenal gland is intact. So the RA system is per se is intact. So that's why they usually don't have any mandylocorticoid deficiency. They manifest only symptoms such as to of glucocorticoid deficiency because the adrenal gland is intact here. Whereas in the primary case, uh, the adrenal gland itself is uh, defective. So there is defect in both the mandylocorticoid and glucocorticoid. But uh, uh, the common to both the conditions is in both the conditions, the adrenal androgen secretion is disrupted. So in both the conditions, the adrenal androgen uh, secretion is disrupted. And uh, coming to the ma one major difference, increased ACTH is seen in primary adrenal insufficiency because of lack of negative feedback from the cortisol. There is increased production of ACTH from the intact pituitary and hypothalamus in, the, in these cases. So increased ACTH, they also mm, uh, increase the uh, say release of POMC. So what happens there is increased melanin deposition in uh, skin creases and also skin areas where the friction is common. So these uh, patients will have hyperpigmentation. Whereas the opposite is true because of uh, decreased ACTH and decreased POMC uh, and also decreased melanin synthesis in the skin. Uh, these patients will have alabaster-like skin, alabaster-like paleness of skin is seen in this patient. So this is a clinically very important to differentiate uh, between primary and secondary adrenal insufficiency. Okay. And one more thing we need to remember: this hyperpigmentation is not only limited to skin creases and. Uh, skin areas where the friction is common. In addition, it is also seen in buccal mucosa.
so it is also a very important clinical finding the signs and symptoms in seen in patients because of glucocorticoid deficiency or fatigue lack of energy weight loss anorexia muscle pains fever remember fever can be seen in addison's disease and uh, normocytic uh, normochromic anemia lymphocytosis and eosinophilia which is uh, because of uh, steroid deficiency hypoglycemia uh, normally cortisol is necessary for gluconeogenesis as this patient are deficient in uh, cortisol uh, especially in children or more prone to develop uh, hypoglycemia attacks okay and in addition because the glucocorticoids have also some melocorticoid actions uh, they will also have low blood pressure and postural hypotension and uh, the hyponatremia seen in patients with glucocorticoid deficiency is predominantly because of SAADH because there is a failure of uh, uh, cortisol inhibiting the uh, release of vasopressin so because of uh, low cortisol levels there is a slightly increased vasopressin levels which in turn leads to mild SAADH and leading to mild hyponatremia okay and uh, this coming to the signs and symptoms seen in uh, melocorticoid deficiency usually these patients uh, will have abdominal pain nausea and vomiting they can even present with acute abdomen so remember addisonian crisis or addison's uh, disease is also one of the differential uh, uh, diagnosis for a patient who who may present with acute abdomen uh, with nausea and vomiting this patient uh, report a partial hypotension dizziness salt craving uh, salt cravings uh, that is that is increased thirst okay low blood pressure and uh, slightly increase serum creatinine because of decreased blood circulation to the kidney decreased uh, blood flow to the kidney decreased blood flow to kidney leads to mild increase in creatinine and uh, because of aldosterone deficiency the patient will have hyperkalemia hyperkalemia with hyp hyponatremia this is a classic feature seen in this patients and uh, adrenal androgen deficiency uh, leads to lack of energy and dry and itchy skin loss of libido and loss of pubic and axillary hair in women okay so coming to the diagnostic and treatment algorithm so when you suspect the patient is having adrenal insufficiency when a patient come to you and she is having chronic weight loss or nausea vomiting okay and on routine investigation you found the patient is having hyponatremia with a hyperkalemia and on examination she is also having hypotension we should suspect adrenal insufficiency if the pigmentation is there we can suspect it is secondary Uh, cause if pigmentation is absent even then we should suspect it could be pr primary adrenal insufficiency right once you uh, clinically suspect the patient is having this uh, adrenal insufficiency we should do a short synactin test okay the short synactin test is also called short cosyntropin test which is nothing but acth okay when you give 250 mg of cosyntropin intramuscularly or intravenously and if you measure the serum cortisol uh, 30 to 60 minutes after giving the injection if it is less than 450 to 500 nanomoles per liter then the diagnosis of addison's disease is confirmed okay in addition we can also do the routines uh, which shows a complete blood picture which shows uh, normocytic anemia eosinophilia and lymphocytosis serum sodium is uh, decrease 
serum potassium is increased creatinine may be slightly increased and urea may be also slightly increased because of decreased perfusion to the kidneys and th may be uh, uh, decreased okay so once the diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency is confirmed then we need to do some other investigations to find out what is the actual reason so for the differential diagnosis we need to do a serum ACTH, aldosterone and serum renin levels in primary adrenal insufficiency what happens is there, uh, because the, ad uh, the adrenal gland is not able to secrete enough serum cortisol there is a high production of uh, uh, ACTH from the pituitary gland because there is no negative feedback inhibition right and uh, what happens to the renin the renin, the renin levels are also high because of hypotension but uh, the aldosterone uh, levels are low because there is mineral corticoid deficiency and uh, hence once this is confirmed once primary adrenal insufficiency is confirmed then the next immediate step is to replacement to replace the glucocorticoids as well as mineral corticoids whereas in secondary adrenal insufficiency what happens the ACTH could be low to normal and uh, the renin levels are normal and the aldosterone levels are also normal okay and uh, we need to replace only the glucocorticoid there is no rep uh, no need to replace the mineral corticoids in case of secondary adrenal insufficiency uh, once the primary adrenal insufficiency is uh, confirmed then we need to further uh, proceed uh, with uh, adrenal autoantibodies okay we, we need to uh, if the uh, adrenal antibodies are positive then the diagnosis is uh, uh, either autoimmune adrenalitis or autoimmune polyglandular syndrome if this is negative if uh, antibodies are negative then we need to look for other causes like a uh, uh, adrenal uh, gland destruction because of infection or infiltration uh, or any other genetic causes right so then we need to do chest x-ray whether the patient is having any pulmonary malignancy or tuberculosis because pulmonary malignancy can cause metastasis to adrenal which can leads to uh, adrenal insufficiency so we basically uh, basic investigation like chest x-ray we need to do and serum 17 hydroxyprogesterate to rule out congenital adrenal hyperplasia especially in men we need to do plasma very long chain fatty acids very long chain fatty acids to rule out x-linked adrenoleukodystrophy and we also need to rule out adrenal CT to see for any tumor or metastasis etc and uh, if any of this is positive if any of this is positive then we need to uh, uh, the diagnosis could be adrenal inspection or infiltration or hemorrhage or congenital adrenal hyperplasia but if they are negative again the autoimmune adrenal adrenalitis is the most likely diagnosis because sometimes uh, the antibodies may be missed uh, uh, while diagnosing while measuring so but in men we need to consider adrenoleukodystrophy especially if uh, vlcf is increased coming to the uh, secondary adrenal insufficiency once uh, we started the patient on glucocorticoid replacement then we should uh, proceed with MRI pituitary gland if the MRI pituitary gland is showing some lesion if it is positive the diagnosis is hypothalamic or pituitary mass lesion so if the the MRI is not showing any uh, thing then we need to rule out whether the patient is having any exogenous glucocorticoid treatment whether he is having show we need to take a detailed history 
whether he is not uh, giving you exact history or whether he really don't know that he is taking a steroids okay and uh, we we need also rule out history of hydroma we should inquire about history of hydroma because hydroma can cause uh, bleeding cns bleeding and the pituitary apoplexy can be occur and uh, we need to consider isolated acth deficiency when uh, everything is negative so this is how uh, we ne we need to diagnose a patient with uh, adrenal insufficiency and uh, this is a uh, treatment plan coming to the most important entity related to adrenal insufficiency it is acute adrenal insufficiency which is also termed adrenal crisis usually occurs after a prolonged period of non specific complaints and is more frequently observed in patients with primary adrenal insufficiency due to loss of both glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid secretions as these patients have both deficiency uh, they are more prone to develop uh, acute adrenal crisis okay uh, what are the uh, clinical features of adrenal crisis uh, the patient will have uh, progress from postural hypotension to the hypovolemic shock the patient will land up in hypovolemic shock and the patient will have uh, features mimicking acute abdomen that are abdominal pain with tenderness nausea vomiting and fever and this patient may also resemble uh, a neurological disease because of their decreased responsiveness to the stimuli and which may progress to stupor and ultimately coma and may die if not treated appropriately and the triggering factors of uh, acute crisis is because of intercurrent illness or surgical stress or uh, hyperthyroidism these are the three main uh, factors that can uh, trigger uh, an attack of uh, adrenal crisis and also uh, in a secondary adrenal insufficiency a sudden stoppage of uh, steroids in a chronic uh, a uh, steroid patient can also trigger adrenal insufficiency similar to this uh, uh, adrenal crisis okay so basically the treatment is as the patient is will be will be in shock we need to give aggressive fluid uh, management to the patient by giving iv fluids at 1 liter per hour and also giving uh, injection uh, hydrocorticoid which is having glucocorticoid action as well as a small mineralocorticoid action uh, we should give at uh, 100 mg iv stat followed by 200 mg in iv infusion preferably or we can also give bolus uh, in the next 24 hours and we know we also need to treat the triggering factors example if the patient is having infection we need to also start the patient on antibiotics and also we need to treat the underlying thyroid disorders and these patients have uh, increased mortality and the mortality rate is about 0.5 cases per 100 patient years so if these patients are not treated appropriately they may die so we have uh, discussed about the treatment for acute adrenal insufficiency that is iv fluids and heavy hydrocortisone so coming now to the treatment of chronic adrenal insufficiency if the patient is having glucocorticoid deficiency so these patients uh, usually have glucocorticoid uh, deficiency and to maintain or to replace the physiological daily cortisol production Uh, they need at least about 15 to 25 mg of a hydrocortisone daily and uh, about 50% of the dose 50% of uh, dose should be given in the morning to maintain the physiology and uh, the dose of uh, Uh, hydrocortisone should be increased by 50% in case of pregnancy 
especially in the last trimester and it also should be increased by 100% that is the dose should be doubled when the patient is having intercurrent illness or uh, surgical stress or having fever or surgery then the patient should uh, take the double the dose of oral dose along with that they also should take uh, IV hydrocortisone 100 milligram daily until the, the stress is passed out okay so otherwise the patient may land up uh, may land up in uh, acute adrenal crisis coming to the mineralocorticoid mineralocorticoid replacement is usually uh, needed for only uh, primary adrenal insufficiency patients because they are deficient in both and uh, to replace uh, uh, the mineralocorticoids it is uh, the usually these patients needs 100 to 150 micrograms of uh, fludrocortisone so this is uh, enough for uh, may have patients to maintain adequate uh, blood pressure and uh, during summer during summer uh, these patients the dose should be increased by 100 micrograms to maintain the blood pressure and uh, usually they do not need any increase in the mineralocorticoid dose during the intercurrent illness because uh, as we are giving the hydrocortisone at high doses as the hydrocortisone also have mineralocorticoid action it will compensate for that for the uh, adrenal androgens normally there is no need of replacement but if the female patient is complaining of loss of libido then we can give 25 to 50 milligrams of DHEA so and these patients uh, treatment can be monitored by measurement of DHEA androstenedione, testosterone, testosterone and sex hormone binding globulin 24 hours after the last DHEA dose so this is how we treat uh, chronic adrenal insufficiency uh, by giving the hydrocortisone to replace the glucocorticoids and giving the fludrocortisone to replace the mineralocorticoids only in case of primary adrenal insufficiency patients and ad adrenal androgens only when the patient is having uh, severe symptoms like loss of libido especially in females especially in females okay generally we usually give treatment Thanks for watching guys, please subscribe for more videos.